The Haunted Hayride at Griffith Park in Los Angeles is my least favorite haunted event. First of all, it costs too much to sit in the back of a tractor. The narrative of the experience, something only available to those curious enough to visit the website, is about a witch who has cursed the crops. It does not translate well to live performance. <laughs> also, the entire thing lasts less than 15 minutes, and then it's a sad three-mile hike to get back to the parking lot unless you've also paid extra for the VIP van. But you'd never know I didn't like it because I own five t-shirts from the one time I went. <laughs> I love merchandise. <laughs> As any of my friends can attest, the best and least annoying part of attending any event with me is my trip to the merch booth, where I will purchase one, two, sometimes seven t-shirts. I have purchased t-shirts bearing the name of singers I love, and singers whose concert I feel it has been a particular torment to get through. At a recent Liz Fair concert, I told my husband, all of these shirts are awful. Before purchasing every one they had in black and a tote bag. And at the Haunted Hayride, I complained about the quality of the attraction, and then I patiently waited in line to spend an extra $75 on everything that fit me. For me, buying merch is a corrective emotional experience. I spent the first years of my life in Moldova, an Eastern European country which is regularly ranked as one of the unhappiest in the world. A place where standing in line for disappointment is ingrained into the soul. Once, my grandmother and I stood in line to buy flavored seltzer water from a street vendor. As soon as I took my first sip, an earthquake hit. My instinct was to run, but my grandmother squeezed my arm in his drink. We waited. We have to return the glass. Imagine surviving an earthquake and not even being able to cake a souvenir. In 1990, we stood in line for shoes, we stood in line for makeup, and sometimes when we got to the front of the line, there would only be more disappointment. A denim vest instead of children's shoes. If we had the rubles, we bought it anyway. We didn't care about colors or sizes or tailor's versions. We cared about being able to trade one pair of two small Levi's jeans for our neighbor's Fila socks, or genuine Puma sneakers that have been rumored to come from a big department store in America. When we left Moldova, we had to give away everything. Clothes, furniture, toys, anything we could not pack had to be dispatched. When we passed immigration in Moscow, the agents took everything that hadn't been checked in his luggage, including our money. When we arrived, we had nothing. A few weeks after we'd settled in, my aunt from New York came to visit. She brought my brother and me shiny plastic jackets. They had buckles on the shoulders and silver zippers on the arms. And in the right conditions, my dad swore they looked as if they had been hewn from genuine imitation leather. <laughs> my parents sent it to school in these coveted status symbols and I learned several valuable lessons. The first was that they were meant to resemble the one that Michael Jackson wore in the bad music video. <laughs> the second was that bondage gear doesn't make you any friends in elementary school, <laughs> especially if it's four years out of date and only the teachers recognize it. <laughs> the third was that in America, you could not only watch a music video, but purchase counterfeit relics from its legacy. And on Pier 39, you can even buy t-shirts declaring you survived the big one, whether or not your grandma made you drink an entire seltzer as the ground shook beneath you. My love for merch is why my two-bedroom apartment is filled with posters that now live on the floor but will one day be framed and hung up. It's why every corner of a room boasts something I purchased at an event because I love owning a memory that I can hold. For a few months, I have been wearing three VIP wristbands from the Trixie Motel, where I spend two days in the peak month of November. I was only supposed to have one bracelet, but I asked for another each time an employee wondered what they could do to make my stay better 
while being unable to reduce the price of the tepid poolside nachos. If you know, you know. I never took the bracelets off. Sometimes people assume these bracelets have a deeper meaning, that I wear them to bring awareness for a disease. The disease is wanting to hold on to an experience for as long as possible, no matter what it is. If you come to my house, you won't have to pay an entrance fee, but you will have to take a tour of all the things that mean something to me, many of which have never been available in stores. That includes a picture of Katie Woodell, who is famous because she was my favorite manager and whose photo I stole off the office wall of greatness <laughs> before I left corporate America forever. Your tour will also include a tooth that my dentist had was forced to extract after a root canal failed. Gets better. If I had to spend four hours and $3,000 getting my mouth fixed, I wasn't leaving without something to show for it. When my gallbladder was removed in 2020, I convinced myself that it was worth it to go under the knife during a global pandemic because I had negotiated with a surgeon to keep the stone that prompted its excision. I will show it to you. You can hold it and take pictures if you'd like. I'll probably insist on it. I would have brought it with me tonight, but I didn't want to get mobbed. As I was changing into my hospital gown for surgery, I snuck several pairs of grippy socks, the number of which you do not need to know, from the equipment cabinet I was left alone with. <laughs> then I handed them out as parting gifts for visiting friends, a piece of merchandise from an important event in my life, a reminder that I had not only survived, but triumphed. If I knew how, I would have embroidered Mark Live, bitch, on them for posterity. I will show you my signed photo of Arsenio Hall. This is not a man that I am a fan of. When I saw the photo in a vintage shop in Las Vegas, I thought, I should call my friend Erica. Then, oh no, she died six months ago. Then, well, that's $35 I don't have to spend. And then I went back and I bought it. Because that's what friends do. They buy merch for the friends who can no longer buy merch for themselves. <laughs> Last year, Heklina, a drag icon on San Francisco legend, died. When I went to her memorial, I marveled not only at the sense of community she inspired, or the fact that a single person thought it was okay to sing two songs at an already four-hour-long service, but also at the sheer number of items I could buy or pre-order to remember her. <laughs> I will die on the hill that there should be more merch at funerals. <laughs> and you should be able to get a t-shirt of me dying on that hill. <laughs> at my funeral. And you should be able to pay with a credit card. Not to keep harping on death, but some of the last words my grandma ever said to me was, Mark, I am dying. <laughs> The dying part wasn't a surprise. She had been slowly declining for weeks. But this moment of lucidity was unexpected. And because I am both trained in psychology and love my grandma very much, I decided not to tell her she was being silly or that she was going to get better. So I put my hand on hers and I said, I know. Come closer, she said. I have something. In general, my grandmother did not traffic in secrets because if she had something to tell you, she was going to say it right to your face. She did not speak fluent English, but her two most used phrases in the English language were, oh my God. <laughs> and Mark, shut up. <laughs> Just a few days before, she had told my husband that she had been grateful to him for marrying me because with my laugh and personality, None of us were sure it was ever going to happen. And I had to translate it. <laughs> For her to want to say something just to me, that was huge. Could this be the moment my grandmother would impart the wisdom of the universe to me? She clutched my hand in one of hers. In the other, she held a stuffed cow in a lab coat that I had purchased from the hospital gift shop for $24.99. Lab coat specified that the cow worked at UCSF. 
and that made it special. She held out the cow to me and slowly said, Mark, you are fat. Like this cow. It is time for you to lose some weight. Then she closed her eyes and fell into a coma. She never spoke again. The next day, I found myself asking my aunt if it'd be okay for me to have my grandmother's wedding ring to wear. That's a great idea, my aunt said. She'd already taken all the other jewelry. (laughs) Do you want to take it now? Maybe knowing someone will have it will make it easier for her to go. My grandma died two hours later. I walked out the hospital with only the story of her final hilarious insult and the ring, which I could bring home and wear and make meaning of. With those two things, her death ceased being just a sad thing that happened to so many grandmas. It had become an experience, an event, complete with commemorative merchandise. (laughs) 